You know, puzzles can be fascinating. They can also be frustrating. If you've ever had the opportunity, which most of us have, to work on a puzzle or struggle through a puzzle, you realize the fascination is trying to understand the mind of the one who put this thing together. And the joy that comes as you get near to the end and you, you start to see those final pieces fall into place. Or, or those, those desktop puzzles, the mind teaser things that drive you nuts for hours. When you finally get that key that unlocks the puzzle, it, it's exhilarating. But puzzles are also frustrating. They're frustrating because there's usually only one way to solve it. The Sudoku box only has one sequence that will actually work. The jigsaw puzzle, the pieces have to go in exactly a specific order or else it does not line up and you do not get the picture at the end. Those de desktop brain teasers have a singular solution. There's only one way out of the maze. That singular solution causes frustration. But once you know the solution, there is an abundance of joy. We're continuing our journey through the book of Acts, as I mentioned. Acts chapter 4 is where we're going to be camping out this morning. And this dovetails in with the same story that we began last week in Acts chapter 3. Remember, Acts is the history book of the New Testament. It records that period of time between the resurrection and ascension of Jesus all the way through the first generation of the church. It's recording God's work in the growth of His church. Last week we saw Peter and John as the church had begun. They were walking into the temple at the hour of prayer. They saw a man who was lame from birth, laying there at the gate. And they didn't have any money to give to him. But Peter said, what I have, I'm going to give to you. And he reached down, took the man by his hand, said, in the name of Jesus, stand, get up. And immediately his feet and ankles were healed. And he began leaping and walking and running around the temple. Obviously this happening in the setting of the temple probably caused a little stir. Most grown adults walking in the temple were very solemn. And together, and their robes were tied nicely. And this man in his you know, beggar's rags essentially was leaping and jumping and, and, and launching himself around the temple complex. And people were like, huh, what is that? A massive crowd began to gather. We know it was large because we see the numbers that are calculated here at the beginning of chapter 4. A crowd began to gather and Peter, as would become his custom, said, hey, here's people. Let's talk about Jesus. And he shared the truth of the resurrection of Jesus, calling people to repent and turn to Christ. And now we pick up the same story in chapter 4, verse 1. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open there. If not, the words will be on the screen here beside me. Follow along as I read aloud. Hear the word of the Lord. As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power... Or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised up from the dead. By Him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone 
that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they heard, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when, they, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign had been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in, that, in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. This is the word of the Lord. The main point of this passage is only Jesus can save. Only Jesus can save. The first thing I want us to recognize in verses 1 through 10 is that doing good for others opens the door to share about Jesus. Doing good for others opens the door to share about Jesus. Look at the story here in verses 1 through 10. Not only have a large crowd gathered there around Peter and John on the basis of this healing, this good deed that had been done for this man. But now, this large crowd had got the attention of the religious leaders. Being greatly annoyed, the text tells us, they came to hear Peter and John. They arrested them. And the next morning, there gathered the entire group of the rulers of the temple. This group is historically called the Sanhedrin. Easily the most powerful men in Jewish life there in Jerusalem. Now, how hard is it to get audience with the leaders of your town, of your city? If you were to go downtown and say, I, I want to talk to the leaders of, of the city of Fort Lauderdale or, or get, a, get a meeting with the mayor, it would take sometimes weeks or months. You go and try to meet with the governor, and, and you're going you're gonna to be in a long waiting line. The Lord opened the door for them to speak to all 70-some of the ruling leaders of Jerusalem. While this was an intimidating setting, these were the educated men. These were the ones who were judges amongst all the people. These were the ones who would lay out what ought to be and not ought to be done. Their question was a softball. For Peter and John, their question came across as, this is exactly what we wanted to talk about. We see in verse 7, the ruler said, when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power and by what name did you do this? Peter's answer, filled with the Holy Spirit, directly ties the good deed done to a crippled man to the power of Jesus Christ. And his resurrection. Look at verses 8 through 10 again. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man was healed, let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. You see, good works are part of the Christian life. Now, our understanding of good works and where they fall within the Christian life matters vitally. But the fact that good works are part of the Christian life should be obvious to those who are Christians. If we put good works in the wrong place, it can be catastrophic to our faith. What we must recognize is that good works are the fruit of being a Christian not the root of being a Christian. 
You see, the, the root refers to what causes or brings about your faith, your Christianity. The fruit speaks to the results of it or the output of it. Good works come out of the life of the Christian, but they are not what makes a person a Christian. If we look at what Paul writes to the Ephesians in these well-known verses in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, what we recognize is this exact order of how this flows. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. This is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This direct tying together is that good works come out of the Christian life and are not the source of the Christian life. Good works are part of the Christian life. Our understanding of good works is massively important because it matters how we see this. If you're walking down the street, down the sidewalk, and you see a mango tree. We've got many here in the neighborhood right behind us. The mango trees are, are beautiful and they're, they're, they're starting to bloom now. You see the, the little flowers coming out that soon will result in these large, heavy fruits hanging down fairly lowly uh, to the sidewalk. So watch your head. And you see that, and you see the mango there, and, and you can quickly identify, oh, that's a mango tree. But the mango doesn't make it a mango tree. The mango is not what makes it a mango tree. You can identify it as a mango tree because you see the mango on it. But what makes it a mango tree is the genetic code that was entailed in that little seed that was planted and grew up to be a mango tree. You see, there's a season when the mangoes don't grow and it's still a mango tree even when the mangoes are not on it. It's still a mango tree even when it's a young sapling incapable of producing fruit because it's too young. It's still a mango tree even when you don't see the mango hanging. But if it's a mango tree, you can expect that at some point you'll see a mango. You see, one leads to the other. The fruit doesn't define the tree. The fruit can only confirm that it is a mango tree, but it can never make it a mango tree. If you're a Christian, your life should be marked by doing good. For that is the fruit of the Christian life. You ought to be marked by forsaking what is cruel and unkind and embracing what displays love and compassion to others. Part of this is rightly reflecting the image of God. For He is perfectly good and perfectly loving. But yet another part to this is God's design that your good works would draw the intrigue and curiosity of others. Because your good works open the door to share Jesus. The text here in verse 4 tells us that on this day, about 2,000 people came to faith in Jesus Christ. If you look at verse 4, But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. We saw a few days or weeks prior, the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were added to the church. And now you see it's up to 5,000. So about 2,000 people in this time frame came to know Jesus. This was a massive crowd. Peter was preaching to a lot of people. He was given audience with them on the basis of the good work done to this crippled man. You see, your good works are often used by God to give you opportunity to share Christ before people who otherwise would never take the time to listen. And this even extends to the religious leaders who came to Peter and John and said, what are you doing? By what power are you healing them? Hey, more people to share with. All at the basis of because they had done good to someone there around them. WD-40 is a brilliant product. In fact, there's a can of it on the rolling cart back there that we keep behind the soundboard just in case. At last count, there are nearly 2,000 uses for this 
simple spray product. WD-40, as I grew up, was considered an essential part to any kit because you can use it for so many different things. But when you read through all of the list of uses, the vast majority of them fall under this broad category. It makes stuck stuff move. If it's stuck, WD-40 will unstick it. That's, that's the vast majority of what WD-40 does. It can make a rusty hinge on a door swing freely. It can remove stains. It can separate containers that have been stacked together. It can open a frozen lock. It can erase crayon. It can help remove gunk, which was one of the official descriptions, that's stuck on just about anything. WD-40 stands for Water Displacement 40, which was, I guess, 40 in the experiment line. And it's a unique blend of lubricants. Here's the thing. In your relationships, good works towards others serve as a kind of WD-40. It helps to move the relationship forward. It helps to advance what otherwise is not movable. Your love for others, doing good to them, serving them, will grease the skids, if you will, in enabling you to speak the word of the gospel to them. But remember, good works are not an end in of themselves. Good works are not the sum total and goal of the whole of what we are to be about. There's a dangerous idea out there amongst the Christian world. And that is that we merely just ought to do good. This comes out of the, a wrong reading of the great two commandments. The two greatest commandments that Jesus gave us are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Some people have deduced this to say the whole of the Christian mission means love other people. And yes, we ought to love other people. But a hundred years ago, this took the form of what's been known as the social gospel movement. We don't need to preach any truth of God. Rather, all we need to do is just try to serve people and help people. In today, it takes the form of the, separ the full-blown separation of love and truth. You can love someone without giving them the truth. The problem is that love and truth cannot be separated. You cannot separate out love from truth. For if you truly love someone, you must tell them the truth. If your doctor came to you and out of fear of offending you refused to tell you you were sick and how to get well, you would not say that he was a good doctor. Good works and loving others, no matter who they are or what they believe, ought to characterize your life, but that is not the end of it. Your good works are designed by God to open doors for you to share the truth of Jesus. The second thing we see in this passage is that only Jesus can save. Look at verses 11 and 12. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter here is roughly citing Psalm 118 verse 22. Clearly asserting that the religious leaders gathered in that room were guilty of rejecting the Messiah. The reference to the cornerstone or the foundation stone is pointing to Jesus as the foundation upon which the whole building of God's kingdom is is founded. The cornerstone was the first one laid, and it defined the rest of the structure. Peter's assertion is that these religious leaders, remember our time frame, were only about two months out, maybe three at most, from the execution and resurrection of Jesus. This same circle of religious leaders were the ones who were hollering, crucify him, who held the trial by night and condemned Jesus to death. But Peter is now standing in their midst, pointing at them, saying, You, the builders, rejected the cornerstone. In 
verse 12, we see one of the clearest statements in the Bible asserting that only Jesus can save. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The understanding of this from the Bible is often called the exclusivity of the gospel. The Christian message is an exclusive message. And what that means is that the Bible teaches that no other world religion or system of belief can result in one being saved. As Jesus himself said to us in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus himself said these words, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's several questions that arise from this. The first is perhaps the most obvious. What does it mean to be saved? Saved from what? The message of Jesus comes first with a bad news. It comes with the reality that every one of us are made in the image of our Creator. God, your Maker, has made each and every one of us. And God is the one who made all the world and all things. He's the one who oversees and sustains and upholds all things. And in doing so, He's the one who sets the rules. He's the one who's established how this ought to run. And yet every one of us, without exception, has rejected the right rule of God. We have rejected His rule, trying to be our own king, trying to be our own ruler. We have rejected Christ. We have rejected God. And we have tried to live life in our own way. The results of this are painfully obvious. Because everything in us and around us is broken. But beyond just being broken in this life, we stand facing the judgment of a holy God. We stand guilty before a holy God facing death and judgment because God is perfect and He cannot let any wrongs go unpunished. See, innately, every human being on earth knows that we owe a debt to our Maker for the wrongs that we have done. Now, who different people identify as their Maker and the way to try to appease that Maker varies wildly based upon different world religions and beliefs and practices. But to be saved means to be rescued from the judgment to come. The difference between faith in Jesus and every other world religion is that every other world religion is telling you what you must do to make God happy. Jesus comes and tells you what God has done for you to welcome you to Himself. He's not calling you to do, but He's declaring that He has done all that is necessary. Calling you to trust Him, to repent, and turn to Him. Because when Jesus came, He came and took on our flesh. He lived the life that you and I could not live. He perfectly obeyed God. And yet God put your sin on Him. He poured out His, His wrath against the sin of the world on Jesus so that by trusting in Jesus, your sins might be forgiven. Jesus rose again three days later, conquering the grave and death, so that all who trust in Him might have life eternal with God. There is no assured salvation, no certain hope in anything or anyone other than Jesus. We need to stop trusting our own works. No matter the system you try to contort them into, all will fail. At best, they will all result in a moderate chance that you might be accepted. But according to the Bible, none of that will ever succeed. Only in Jesus can your sins be fully paid for and you receive perfect righteousness before your God and your Maker. You need to turn and trust in Jesus. The second question that comes out of this, the exclusivity of the Gospel, is simply the question of fairness and justice. That just doesn't seem right. 
It just doesn't seem right that there would be only one way. It's just, that doesn't seem fair. It hardly seems right that sincere worshipers of other gods who go through great lengths to try to appease them should get rejected in the end. After all, doesn't the same light shine through every stained glass window? Don't all roads lead to the top of the same mountain? From our human perspective, in our limited sense of justice and fairness, we push back against this idea that there is only one way in Jesus. But we must remember first that our opinion is not what makes right and wrong. It's God who determines right and wrong. It's His world, it's His rule, it's His design. We must remember that it is not our opinion of this that matters, but what has God said in His Word. This is His world, His rule. We don't have the standing to argue, object, or debate what He has decided. Justice and fairness is defined by Him. And given our universal sin against His perfect and holy nature, what is truly fair and just is that no one would be accepted. What is perfectly fair and just is that only Jesus, who lived perfectly, would get accepted. But God in His love sent Jesus that He might be a substitute for you and for me. God sent Jesus so that your sins might be forgiven because He punished Jesus in your place. That is what is unfair. Jesus suffers for your sins and you're rewarded for His obedience. That is what is unfair in the Gospel. The cry for fairness presumes that our sinfulness is not as bad as it really is and it presumes that God is less than who He's proclaimed Himself to be as perfect and holy. And tied to this is the idea that it's prideful for Christians to even say that there's one way to God. Somehow that we, the, the claim that Jesus is the only way is a statement of pride. But when we understand that we are saved by grace alone, as we read earlier in Ephesians 2, that it's literally unmerited favor that gives you right standing with God, if it's unmerited, there's no place for pride. If there were a cure for this coronavirus, this COVID-19, you would not call it prideful for the one who had the cure to walk through the hospitals around the world sharing it. You would call it love. And at the same time, if the person who had the cure for the sake of not wanting to look prideful sat back quietly holding it to themselves while others suffered and died, you would look at that person and say they were hateful and unloving. Jesus is the only way to God. It's not my idea. It's God's good and loving plan. The last big question amongst many that we could explore, the last one for this morning, is what does this mean for the Christian? The only right response from the Christian is to passionately share with every person we can the message of Jesus. You know, there's a series of phone commercials out there for cell phone carriers. And uh, <clears throat> one of the first ones was a medical setting where a doctor was walking through the hall saying, Hey, guess who just got reinstated? <laughs> and he walks into the room. This guy's getting ready for some major operation. And he says, Hey, you nervous? Yeah, me too. It's not what you want to hear from your doctor. And you see the panic on the guy's face. He hasn't even said anything at this point. And you just see panic on his face. And the doctor turns around and says, ah, don't worry, it'll be okay. And then the tagline for the, the, the cell carrier is, when okay is not okay. Just okay is not okay. Christian. If Jesus is the only way to be saved, the people around you who think they're okay are not okay. The person in the unreached village in the middle of the mountains of Nepal 
who thinks they're okay by worshiping their ancestors and burning offerings to them are not okay. The people in our city, in our county, who are going about their lives thinking they're okay are not okay. If Jesus is the only way to be saved, then we must be driven with a passion to reach all people with the gospel message. Because without Jesus, no one is just okay. The Bible clearly and unquestionably teaches that only in Jesus can you be saved from your sins. Friend, if you're here today and the gospel is making sense to you, perhaps for the first time, turn and trust Him. Christian, does your life reflect this truth? If people looked at your life, would they see that he believes or she believes that there is only one way to be right with God? Are you passionately seeking to share this one way of hope with the people around you? The third thing we see in this, let your only offense be Jesus. Look at verses 14 through 18. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they, that's the Sanhedrin, that's the religious leaders, had nothing to say in opposition but when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through, through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But in order that they may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. You can see this body of leaders searching desperately for something they can do to squelch the apostles. They're searching desperately for anything they can find to put a lid on what the apostles are doing. But they can't find anything to lock them up with. The people are rejoicing. The people are celebrating. This man's been healed. Verse 1 and 2 make it clear, as we saw as we opened Peter and, Peter and John are speaking to the people. The priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed. Why? Not because they had healed somebody, but because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. It was their proclamation of Jesus that got them in trouble. There was no other trouble to be had. There was nothing else in their life that they could look to and say, Ha! Ah, you're locked up for this. It was only the message of Jesus. Peter writes later on to the church in 1 Peter chapter 3. Essentially, exhorting the church based on his testimony from here in Acts chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 3, he writes this. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer... For righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy. Always be prepared to make defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience. So that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will them for doing evil. Peter's teaching in this passage in 1 Peter is mirroring his testimony from Acts chapter 4. He and John were doing good to this man. It gave them the opportunity to share the gospel. And when people got upset that they were sharing the gospel, the only thing they could get upset at was that they were sharing the gospel. There was nothing else they could throw at them. There was nothing else they could accuse them with. There's nothing else they could tear them down with. No one could bring a charge against the apostles because they were doing only good and preaching Jesus. Realize the gospel is offensive enough. The first message of the gospel, as we talked about, is that you are sinful facing the judgment of God. This is not a happy conversation starter most of the time. 
Some honest people will respond with, yeah, I know, but many will respond with, how dare you tell me I'm wrong? So straight out of the gate, the Christian message is going to offend. But Peter's exhortation, and indeed his example from Acts chapter 4, is that your life ought to be lived in such a way that the only offense is the message of the gospel. Your life ought to display love and care as Jesus loved and cared. So that the only anger others may have with you is when you tell them that Jesus alone is the way to God. Paul writes of his pattern of life in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, a similar understanding. When you see Paul's passion here in verses 19 through 23, Paul says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. You see, what Paul embodied, what he embraced, was realizing that any offense outside of Christ is not worth it. Yeah, we may have the rights and the freedoms to assert certain things, but any offense that we carry and that we lay out outside of Jesus is not worth it. The only offense that should characterize your life is that you believe and proclaim and call others to believe that Jesus is the only way to God. Everything else is good and love towards others. The priority and love of the gospel ought to be the center of your life and everything else around it ought to be fashioned for the gospel's advance. Christian, live in such a way that your only offense is Jesus. The fourth thing, as we wrap it up, we must speak of Jesus. Look at verse 13 and then verses 19 through 22. Now when they, that's the Sanhedrin again, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. Verse 19 but Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. The dialogue here is almost comical. You see the, the, the Sanhedrin just wringing their hands trying to figure out how will we stop them? What can we do? And they say, okay, don't talk about Jesus anymore. And then Peter and John respond by essentially honoring them, saying, you're the judges of Israel. You're the ones who are supposed to speak for God to the people. Is it right before God to listen to you before we listen to God? You see, these men have been with Jesus. Verse 13 reveals the shocking boldness of Peter and John. And this is due to the Holy Spirit speaking through them as we saw in the earlier verses of the chapter. The Holy Spirit empowered them to speak boldly. The religious leaders recognized that they had been with Jesus. I don't think this is some sort of supernatural aura. I think more, more so, we are only talking about a couple months removed, they had seen these guys with Jesus in the temple as Jesus was teaching the week before his execution. They knew that entourage. They knew that these guys were part of that group. But because they had been with Jesus and were witnesses to the resurrection, received the power of the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of their sins, they could not and would not stop talking. You know, we talk about the things we love. I share that regularly because we need to remember it. 
We talk about the things we love. The more that we love Jesus, the more we will be talking about Him. The more that we love His Word, the more it will come out in our regular conversation. The apostles were not sitting there throwing a temper tantrum like a child. No, I won't stop talking. That's not the picture. Rather, they are humbly declaring that they must talk about Jesus no matter what. What is it in your life that everyone knows, everyone who knows you is aware of? Is it Jesus? I'm not advocating browbeating people with the gospel every time you see them, but I fear we often fall to the other side of that dynamic, treating the gospel message like some sort of contraband which we're fearful to reveal we have or know. If this passion and boldness is lacking in you, start by spending more time in the Word, more time in prayer, more time communing with your God. Pray and ask that God will give you the opportunity and the boldness to speak, and then quite simply, go for it. Go for it. Lovingly speak of Jesus. When we have experienced the deep love and rescue of Jesus, we cannot help but speak of Him. Most puzzles only have one correct answer. That can be frustrating. But when you find the right solution, there is an abundance of joy. Only Jesus can save it's the only way that you can be reconciled with your Maker. It's the only way that a lost and dying world can be made right with their Maker. Only Jesus can save. Good works are part of the Christian life. But it's not the root. It's the fruit of it. And it's designed by God in part for the advance of the gospel message. The gospel is an exclusive message. There's only one way to be right with God. And friend, whatever else you're trusting, it will not help you pass this life. Trust in Jesus. For His finished work holds promise for this life and the life to come. Christian, don't live a life that unnecessarily offends others. Let your only offense be Jesus. For we must speak of Jesus. For the people around us are not just okay. Everyone needs Jesus. Let's pray again. Merciful Father, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the joy of knowing the solution for how to be right with you. For knowing the gospel that Jesus came and made us right. Lord, I pray that you would grow our faith. Grow our passion. That we would love you more. And that we would boldly proclaim the joy that only Jesus saves. Lord, work in us now. That we would respond to you in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.